Welcome to Data Mining and Statistical Learning. So this is uh, the first lecture for this course, and I'm going to give a little bit of introduction to the course, um, a little bit about what to expect, um, and then we're going to do a little bit of linear algebra review. So there's a couple resources I want to draw your attention to. Uh, the first one of them being the Blackboard page. So here's our lovely Blackboard page. I will um, uh, primarily be using this to um, post uh, some solutions to, to homework problems, um, to post announcements on. Uh, most of the content uh, for this course is going to be on our GitHub page. Uh, there will be a link on Blackboard to this page, but it's gjhunt.github.io slash 688spring21. Um, and here's our course, Data Mining Statistical Learning um, Spring 21. There's some content up here. There's a, a, a real brief syllabus um, talking about the course. Um, and we'll hold off on that for a second. There is a kind of tentative course outline, which tells you something about the topics for the course um, and approximately when we're going to get to these. Um, but this is not. Uh, this, this will change over the course of the semester. Um, important dates are the 23rd of March will be our, our sit-down midterm exam, which will be um, on Blackboard. Um, and then the final, and in lieu of a final examination, we're actually going to do final projects and presentations. Um, and currently that is slated for May 18th. Um, I think we're going to try and kind of find a time that better works for everyone, um, since there are going to be some conflicts with that time. Other than that, this, this page is going to have um, the notes and the lectures, um, the videos that I'm going to upload to YouTube. And it's going to have the labs, the code, and the videos for those labs. So broadly, this course is going to be broken down into kind of two components for, for each um, session. So we're kind of on a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. We're going to try and do about 50 minutes to an hour of, quote, lecture, which is going to be some background material, some theory. And then we're going to do 20 minutes to half an hour of a kind of lab session. We're going to talk about some code. We're going to run some code. We're going to talk about how to run some code. Um, and um, so that's kind of the breakdown of the course. Um, the course will have um, problem sets that are going to be due kind of every two, two weeks or so. Um, and they're going to kind of lightly grade those, kind of a spot check um, grade. I'm probably not going to grade every single problem, but I'm going to I'm going to look through them a little bit, um, and uh, I'll post solutions to those. Um, additionally, we're going to have some coding practice on Data Camp, uh, and I'll explain that a little bit more in an email. Um, but that will there will be assignments on there, and that will give us some kind of hands-on practice with coding in addition to the problem sets, which will be Problem sets will be a mix of theory and some coding, um, some real data analysis. Um, I have this welcome announcement here, which I'll send out as a Blackboard um, announcement too, explaining some of this. There's no real re required book for the course. Um, not surprisingly, we're using um, Elements Statistical Learning by Hastiff Jerani Friedman, um, kind of as the main guide. My lectures will vaguely follow this book for parts of, of the course, but primarily the lectures are going to be the, the the best way to, to keep on top of, of, of this. There's also kind of a, um, a more undergrad version of this book called An Introduction to Statistical Learning. Um, and both these books are great. Um, and uh, I also have some information here about office hours, um, some information about data camp, um, big term final, all that good stuff. I'll send this out in an email. Um, and uh, yeah. So that's, that's the important stuff in the course. This, you, you can take some time to look through this. I'll explain it um, in an announcement um, a little bit more in detail. Um, so what I want to do today is we want to talk a little bit about an introduction to this course. So this course is, is titled Data Mining. Um, I will refer to it as Data Mining and Statistical Learning or just Statistical Learning. Um, I have a slight preference for calling this the course statistical learning, which is maybe a little bit more in line with um, what I'm going to be teaching. So um, what is statistical learning? Statistical learning is basically um, kind of mm, applied machine learning done by statisticians. 
So um, many of you may have taken other courses that are uh, kind of in machine learning, applied statistics realm. Um, and some of the topics that we're going to cover in the course will overlap with those topics. But you'll see that I'll teach this all kind of in a very statistician way. So I'm going to approach all these topics very much in a statsy way, where we're talking about a model, we're talking about probabilities, um, we're talking about expectations and how to approximate probabilities. Um, so even if you've seen some of this for, before, it's going to be a different take on some of this. Um, so why am I teaching statistical learning? Well, I'm a statistician. Um, and so here's my, my lovely web page. If you scroll down to the bottom here, here's the two courses I'm teaching. CSI 688 is, of course, our course. And... I'm a statistician. This is kind of the way I think about these things. Um, and many times in kind of the introductory lectures, people talk a little bit about, you know, give this grandiose view of what machine learning is or applied statistics is or data mining is. I think oftentimes that is a bit, um, a bit of fluff that is probably unnecessary. Um, I don't think I need to motivate the course too much. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting um, stuff. And anyways, you want the credits, so you're taking the course, right? Um, I thought I might give a little bit of background on myself and some of the projects I do, and I think all of them basically fall in the kind of statistical, uh, statistical learning uh, framework to, to, to one extent or another. So, um, so I'm an applied statistician. I have many degrees in statistics, um, and I have a couple projects here up on my website. Um, and uh, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about some of these projects um, to give you a sense of the stuff I do, but also to give you a sense of some of the um, how kind of statistical learning has played into these projects. So one of the projects I have is cell type proportion estimation. And this is, uh, so here we click on HPSE, which is hybrid scale proportion estimation. Um, and um, this is, we're taking large genomic data sets and we're trying to figure out from these genomic data sets what the cell type composition of the data sets is. So we're trying to solve a prediction problem. Oh, it's 5% of T cells, 20% of B cells, et cetera. Um, something I'm interested in is producing software that actually works. So you'll see I, I have uh, an R package available for this. Um, and um, this, this problem is, is very much involving linear models, what statistics are called linear models, which is basically regression and predicting things with regression. Um, another good project is this uh, robust rescaling, this image-based cell profiling project. Um, so again, I like software, and I'm going to try and teach you some of the useful um, uh, uh, ways to use software for statistical learning. And since practically, I use it in a lot of work, and practically that's what you're going to get paid for at the end of the day, is being able to write reasonable software. So, I, so you know, I think a statistical learning course in a, you know, at a master's level really should emphasize theory to a certain extent and try to be more than just a topics course and more than just typing commands into a console. Um, you know, I try to bring together and relate in, in a kind of a, in a broad way all the different um, things we are going to look at this semester. But I think it still is important to practically have software um, writing tools or, or at least coding tools. Anyways, this, 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 this um, robust rescaling project is um, a proteomics project. Um, and basically, we're using something, or we're doing a couple things. Well, one of the things we use in this project is called principal components analysis, um, which is summarizing the data. So the pictures up here is basically uh, of what we're going to call principal components. And that's going to be a topic we're going to touch on the course. Um, Uh, let's see, I do some, some projects in engineering. So here's this SVSA project, um, Support Vector Spectrum Approximator. This again is going to use principal components analysis. Basically, we're trying to approximate these spectral line shapes very quickly. Um, this is for um, some fluid dynamics problems. And we're uh, combining basically principal components analysis, which is what we're going to learn. It's called an unsupervised technique with support vector machines. So that's where our support, the, the term support vector comes from here. Hopefully we'll get to support vector machines um, uh, uh, kind of near the end of the course. They're, they're super cool. 
Um, and maybe the last one I'll talk about um, here is this adaptive pressure profile tracking. Here, we're again looking at um, using pressure data to track some fluid phenomena in some high speed uh, air breathing engines. Um, and we're using what's called online regression. So that's very much a, a, a hot topic in um, statistical learning. And uh, we're kind of adaptively learning a model over time that's using kind of online regression. Most of the work I do, though, is um, very much into statistical learning and kind of applied um, statistics. Um, so that's kind of some background. Some of the stuff I do, I think it's a little more personal in talking about, uh, you know, all the, the good problems that are out there, you know, self-driving cars, um, cancer diagnostics. Um, those are all great problems. Those are all kind of problems that statistical learning is going to try to... Um, tries to tackle and people are using it to try to tackle those problems. Um, but I think that that's enough fluff for now. I think I don't need to sell this course too hard because I think this stuff is kind of machine learning and statistical machine learning is, is, is super interesting. So what I think that we probably should do, uh, we have about 40 minutes here um, for the remainder of the kind of lecture portion of this is the first thing I want to do is I want to do a review of linear algebra. Um, so that's going to be our linear review, and that's going to take up the kind of next 40 minutes of the lecture here. Um, most of this will probably be some review. Some of it might be new. I'm going to post some some uh, some some scans from from a book. People feel like they need to um, review this a bit more. Statistical learning and applied statistics generally is incredibly linear algebra. Um, uh, dependent. So we're gonna, I, I like linear algebra personally. I'm going to work it a lot into this course, um, but it naturally is just, that's the skill. Um, and so to really to do applied statistics, you really need to know linear algebra. To really understand these techniques, you need to know linear algebra. So we're going we're gonna to do a review of linear algebra, um, and this might spur people to, do a, to dust off those linear algebra books and do a little bit of a, of a review there. So why do we care about linear algebra? I mean, basically, the reason linear algebra is important is that data can, let's say, often be represented as a matrix. And so statisticians doing kind of statistical learning uh, basically view everything from, from matrix on up. Basically, we view uh, the world as consisting of data matrices, or that's where data creation starts. If you're really kind of a hardcore data scientist, you might be interested in, in, in lower level data generation processes. But um, for statisticians, the world begins with a data matrix. Matrices are, are obviously, you know, a central topic of discussion for linear algebra. So here's an example data matrix. Uh, let's call it X. And um, one way, and the way we're going to be encoding data in this class is where <clears throat> um, columns are going to be variables and rows are going to be observations. So you could, you could flip that around. Sometimes people do. This is the way I'm used to doing it, and this is the way we're going to do it. So the idea is that if I have um, observations, maybe I have observations on four people, um, person one, person two, person three, person four, and maybe for these people I have measured um, weight, I have measured height, and I have measured age. And so for each person, I have this variable measured. And so correspondingly, I kind of have a two by two table where we call it matrix. Um, and uh, so I can put the values in my matrix. Any kind of numerical variable, we'll see how to deal with non-numeric things um, in lecture two. But anything kind of numerical variables you measure, you can put in a matrix. So maybe my weights are 100, uh, 150, 320, 300. Uh, my heights are uh, 6.1, 5.5, 7.3, and 6. Sure. 
And my ages are 25, 45, 75, and 30. So there's some data, there's some potential data. And in this case, we, we have, um, what do we have? We have, I'm gonna say capital N in our case is gonna be the number of observations. So we have N equal four rows. And I'm gonna use P, um, maybe I'll use capital P. Um, as the number of columns, we have p equals three variables. Uh, this is a common notation uh, among statisticians as number of samples, and p is a uh, number of variables. So there are a couple of ways that we can we can break apart a data matrix. Um, basically, you can view it either as a collection of rows or a collection of columns. Um, as so here's one way which is uh, let's say a collection of rows so x1 x2 x3 x4 so here xn is the nth uh, observation. Above those are people. Um, and so in this, you know, e each of these x sub n's are in rp. They're a p-dimensional vector, and they're an observation. Um, you know, for example, let's say x1 would be that first row is my first person is 100, 6.1, 2 uh, 2.5, 25, 25. <clears throat> and this is a three dimensional vector. Um, we can also view a data matrix as a collection of columns. So this first, the first view when you view as a collection of rows is basically called you know, a row-wise row uh, view of the matrix or of the data where they live in RP. In this case, if we view it as columns, um, I'm going to use capital X's um, to denote my columns. We have what? We have three columns, one, two, and three. Um, here, X... Uh, little p is the pth variable. Um, and these are in Rn. So you can basically view a data matrix either, either as a collection of vectors in Rp, that is row-wise, or as a collection of uh, variables uh, in Rn. So the p vectors in Rn or n vectors in Rp. Yeah, so for example, for a second case, um, x1, which was our collection of uh, weights, was uh, 100, 150, 320, 300, and this was in R, what was it in? It's R4, obviously. So those are kind of two different ways we can view our matrices, um, and both will be very relevant as we talk through this course, but um, the notation here, I'm trying to standardize capital letters is our matrices, these, these middle script um, uh, letters are going to denote uh, the rows and the, and the capital ones with the subscripts are going to denote my uh, columns. In any case, the, this course, we're basically always going to be encoding data as matrices and matrices are kind of collections of vectors in one way or another. And so we need to talk about matrices and vectors, and we're going to bring many of the tools of linear algebra to bear on, um, on data matrices and, by extension, onto data. So let's talk about, let's, some of this is going to be an obvious review, but we're going to get to, by the end, some stuff that probably you haven't seen before. So let's talk about uh, inner products and norms let's say, of vectors. So 
if I have two vectors a and b and they're in let's say rp then the inner product uh, or sometimes called dot product is uh, either denoted a dot b or denoted a prime b or denoted a oops a transpose b is um, just the sum of uh, <clears throat> of the uh, product of the elements. So it's a sum k goes one to p of a k b k. So here um, a is going to be a and b are going to be vectors in R p. Or um, if you want to be very specific, it's p by one. So this, so they are. Um, we're thinking of vectors as column vectors, like this, and so a transpose is the corresponding row vector, like that. The transpose obviously just turns a vector on its side. That's the inner product. Um, and we also have vector norms. So the norm of a vector is basically its length. And um, we denote a norm with double bars, or I will be in this class. So that, um, which um, can be defined in a couple different ways. The simplest definition is it's just the, uh, well, it's the square root of the sum of the squares, right? Something like that, right? Try that. That's the norm of a vector. Of course, one way, one nice way you can write it is square root of the inner product of A with itself, right? So if you think about what A transpose A, or the inner product of A with itself is, that will just be the sum of the squares. Take the square root of that. That gives me back my norm. So norms basically measure distances, right? So if I have a vector, um, it has a direction, and it has a length or norm. So that's probably pretty straightforward. People are familiar with that. One question we can ask is what about matrices? Matrices is the proper plural of a single matrix. <clears throat> so first of all, we should talk about matrix products, which, uh, or matrix multiplication. If I have a, a matrix A, that is, let's say, M by N, and I have another matrix B that is, uh, let's say, N by P, then we can define the product AB, and this is we can define it as long as these inner dimensions match. So inner dimension matches, so we're good. You can't define a matrix product if the inner dimensions don't match. But if they do, we can define the matrix product. And there are a couple ways to define it. In fact, there are more than a couple ways to define it. And it's a super rich operation. One way is we sum over the inner dimension. So the inner dimension is n. We sum over some index, let's say k, 1 to n. And it is a, if I want to get the ijth element, so let me back up here. The product AB is going to be a matrix in the outer dimensions, M by P. And if I want to get the ijth entry of this product matrix, it is, I can get it as a sum over the inner dimension of AIK times BKJ. So the way to remember this is that you, the inner dimensions match and the outer dimensions, um, that's gonna get cluttered up, but the outer dimensions also match. So K is matched in the middle, the first one goes with the I, and the second one goes with J. Another way 
is that we can notice that this is just a certain inner product, that this is basically the inner product of the row uh, I of the matrix A times the column, the jth column of B. So one very useful way of thinking about uh, matrix multiplication, the element wise, the IJ entry is row I of A times column J of B. So you can even write this out. Um, how do we want to write this? Let's draw a little picture. So my product matrix is A by B. And if I want the IJ entry here, right? So this is some entry of my matrix. Uh, this is entry IJ. This is going to be row I of A dot product with column J of B. Another way, there's a bunch of ways to think about matrix multiplication. We'll, we'll look at some more as the course goes on. Another way is if my matrix B is composed of columns B1, 2, and how many columns we say? We said this had B had P columns. If B has columns B1 to BP, in this case, the matrix product AB can be thought of as the matrix A uh, B1, that would be the first column. The second column of the product matrix would be A times B2, etc. The last column be A times BP. So this is using uh, because the columns can be thought of as just a columns B can just be thought of as a you know, one column matrix. You can define you know, matrix times vector or matrix times one column matrix. That would give you columns. And this is another very useful way of thinking about um, matrix multiplication. What about norms? Not surprisingly, maybe, <clears throat> you can also define a norm for matrices. So for vectors, we had defined the norm of a vector as um, the square root of A transpose A. The slickest way to write it. For a matrix, capital A, uh, let's say this is a N by P matrix, then The one way we can define the matrix norm, and uh, we take our matrix, put bars around it, and uh, typically you put an, a little F down, because this is the Frobenius norm. There are lots of different matrix norms. Just to be careful, this is what's called the Frobenius norm. And, you know, for vectors, you could think of it as the square root of the sum of the squares of the elements. For a matrix, you could similarly similarly think of this as the sum of the square, the square root of the sum of the square of the elements. Here, though, we need to, instead of summing just over the one index, we have to sum over all rows and columns. So that's called the Frobenius norm of a matrix. We just you square the elements of it, we sum up take the square root. So it's very similar to matrix norm. And there's actually a slick way to write it. For vectors, you could say it's the square root of A transpose A. For a matrix, you could say it's the square root of the trace of A transpose A. So a couple things, just to make sure everything's correct here. One, A transpose is going to be a P by N matrix, since A is going to be an N by P matrix. 
So A transpose A is well defined. The inner dimensions match. They're both N. And the outer dimensions uh, are both P. So A transpose A is a P by P matrix. <clears throat> so A transpose A is well defined. Secondly, the trace of a matrix, um, whatever, is the sum of the diagonal elements. So we take A transpose A, we take the diagonal elements, and then we take the square root of it. And you can think about why that is equivalent to my other definition here. Um, but that's, that's one way of defining matrix norms. Um, and, and, and we'll use those uh, later in the course. Some other useful topics, um, let's say linear independence. So we say that some vectors, let's say x1, uh, yeah, x1 to xp, let's say they're n-dimensional vectors, are linearly independent if, if I can take a linear combination of them if I have a linear combination of them that is zero is the zero vector then it must be that all of the C's are zero. So if I can find a linear combination of these X's that give me the zero vector, it must be all the C's are zero. So that's the definition of linear independence. If they're not linearly independent, they're linearly dependent. The, the, it's kind of a technical definition. The main idea is that if, uh, uh, if vectors are linearly dependent, I can write some of them as a linear combination of others. And this is not true if the vectors are independent or linearly independent. So if they're dependent, I can write one of them as a linear combination of the other ones. If they're dependent, uh, if they're independent, I cannot write one of them as a linear combination of the others. Um, so I'm going to write something here. Independence is basically no overlapping. linear information. So for dependence, say in probability, somehow knowing something about one doesn't tell me something about another. Independence uh, of vectors is kind of a similar idea. If we think of vectors maybe as columns of a data matrix, if they're dependent, I'd say one variable can be written as a linear combination of the others. So I kind of know one variable if I have the other ones, at least this, I can linearly reconstruct it. If they're independent, there's no way to linearly construct one of the variables from the other. So it kind of contains some information that they don't have. Um, so thinking about this in terms of data matrix, this idea which is purely mathematical about linear, linear independence is um, starts to take on some real, some real meaning about overlapping information. Um, inverses, let's talk about inverses real quick. Um, if we have some matrix A that is N by N, so it's square, and there exists a matrix B, it's also square matrix, so that A 
B is the same thing as B A, which is the identity matrix. That is, it's a diagonal matrix um, with ones down the main diagonal. Then B is called the inverse of A and denoted A with a little minus one superscript. So that's called the inverse matrix. <clears throat> um, the fact here is that A has an inverse if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. So there's about a million ways to um, characterize uh, invertibility of a matrix. One of them is independence. Linear independence is equivalent. Uh, the columns of the matrix is equivalent to invertibility of the matrix. Okay. The next thing I'm going to talk about uh, is projections, which is super near and dear to the heart of statistician. We'll get to that real quick. And we're going to see that regression is basically just projection of, of data onto a certain subspace. Um, if I have two vectors, x and y, then the projection of y onto x is, and we can maybe denote it as y hat is my projection. Mm, y hat is the projection of of, um, of, uh, of y into x. If I had, I can write it as ux times ux transpose y. Uh, here, ux is a unit vector in the direction of, um, of x. So the picture is that I have vector x and I have some other vector y and I have some unit vector ux in the direction of x. Then if I want to figure out basically if I project y down onto here, this we'll call y hat, how do I figure out what that vector is? Well, this tells me the amount ux, trans UX transpose y tells me the amount y is in the direction of x and then I multiply it by a vector in the direction of x. So you so the amount here is basically ux transpose y that's that distance <clears throat> and then I want to make it actually a vector rather than just a scalar and so I multiply it by a unit vector in that direction and that gives me the projected vector of y onto x. So how do I get ux? Of course, if I want to get a unit vector in the direction of x, I can just take x and divide by its norm. That will give me a vector with, uh, with um, unit length, and uh, that's in the direction of x. And so what this means is that I can write y hat as, um, how do we want to write this? We want to write this x over norm x, that's ux, times x over norm x transpose uh, y. And uh, so I'm going to write this as x uh, times x transpose y. And then I'm going to note here that the bottom is just going to be norm of x squared, which is just x transpose x, right? The norm of x is the square root of x transpose x. so uh, norm of x squared is x transpose x, so I can write this in the bottom. So one way to write the projector of, of this is x transpose, x, x transpose y over x transpose x. But I can bring this up, I can write this, it's just a scalar, right? x transpose x is just the square of a, of a number, it's a scalar. So I can say it's x, and then I'm going to say it's x transpose x inverse, and then I'm going to say it's x transpose y. I'm allowed to do that. x transpose x inverse is just 1 over x transpose x, right? 
Why have I done that? So this seems complicated. What about matrices? So here's the scenario is I have a matrix A um, and let's say it's N by P and the column space of A is the span of the columns of A and this is a subspace of um, Rn. Right, the columns of, of A are in n dimensional vectors. The column space is therefore the span of these. There's just some subspace in Rn. So if this is Rn over here, maybe not all of it, but there's some subspace in here that is the column space of A. And if I have a vector, maybe I have a vector, oh, let's not do that. Here's my vector y. I could ask, you know, there's some projection of y onto this subspace. What is the projection of y onto the column space of A? And what's the answer? The answer is that this y hat vector, well, I'm just going to pretend that my formula up here is actually talking about matrices instead of vectors. It is a, A transpose A inverse matrix, A transpose Y. So this is proof by analogy, uh, you might call it. This thing is called the projection matrix. Uh, it's the projector onto column space of A, and it takes uh, also called the hat matrix, we'll get to that, but it takes a, a vector y and produces y hat, and it y hat being the projection onto the column space of A. So if I want to project y in the column space of A, I left multiply by A, A transpose A inverse, A transpose Y. By the end of the course, you will have that committed to memory. That is a matrix you just have committed to memory. Okay. So let's continue making some analogies of things we know about vectors and um, bringing them up to talking about matrices. So we have unit vectors, which is obviously that a vector u is a unit vector if its norm is 1. For matrices, a kind of unit vector is called an orthogonal uh, matrix. So orthogonal for vectors is that if u transpose v equals 0, then u um, is what orthogonal to v. So here u and v are, let's say, vectors. Um, and all this means is that, right, that u and v are at right angles to each other in some grand sense. <clears throat> for matrices, as I said, The kind of corresponding concept of a unit vector is called an orthogonal matrix. And we say that a matrix Q is orthogonal um, and so this thing is going to be, let's say it's a square matrix, so it's n by n. It's orthogonal if um, 1, all the columns of Q are unit vectors, and two, the columns are mutually or pairwise orthogonal to each other. So there's a couple of ways to characterize this. Um, let's say IE, if I take the ith column transpose the jth column, this is 0 if i is not equal to j, right? So that, that comes from 
the second part, which says that the columns are mutually orthogonal. <clears throat> and if i is equal to j, that is going to be just the squared norm of the i or j column, and that's going to give me 1 because they're all unit vectors. Or another way to say this is that q transpose q is the identity matrix. And you can think about why that is true, but that's basically what we wrote here, is that the uh, off-diagonal entries are 0 and the on-diagonal entries are 1. That corresponds to them being mutually orthogonal and univectors. Or what's the matrix? What do you call it if a matrix is, uh, if I multiply a matrix by something and I get the identity, the inverse matrix is transpose. So I'm trying to write this right. So this is the same thing as saying that the inverse of Q is just the transposition of Q. And you can think about why that's true. It basically comes from this condition. If I multiply Q on the left or right by Q transpose, I get, uh, get the identity matrix. So those are going to play a big part in this course. And the last thing we're going to want to review here, and maybe the last uh, 10 minutes here, are, are uh, eigenvectors um, and eigenvalues. So um, if we have a, a square matrix a, then V is an eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue lambda if A by V just gives me a rescaling of V by lambda. So A, V is lambda V. That's obviously the, the key definition for eigenvectors. Eigenvectors are incredibly important. We're talking about matrices, right? They're kind of characteristic. That's what eigen means. They're characteristic um, vectors of the matrix. I mean, there's a deep connection of what these things tell us about a matrix. And so if I have a data matrix that represents data, we're going to see in this course that the eigenvectors tell us something deep about the data. I mean, they're going to show up all over the place um, in this course. So some special matrices with special eigenvectors, if, um, let me back up, let's say we say a matrix is symmetric if Aij is equal to Aji, it's supposed to be Ij, Aij. Now basically the idea is that we have reflection about this line. So reflected slash symmetry about the main diagonal. Right? <clears throat> that, was, that is what this condition means. So an example being 1, 2, 0, 2, 5, 3, 0, 3, 7. It's a diagonal matrix, right? Here's the main diagonal, and across it it's reflected. 2 is reflected, the 0 is reflected, 3 is reflected. Symmetric matrices, turns out, are incredibly important. It's kind of a obscure fact, but they're super important. If A is some n by n symmetric matrix, then it has n, or I'm going to call eigen pairs, pairs of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, v1, lambda1, v2, lambda2, all the way up to v, capital N, lambda, capital N. <coughs> um, 
and the uh, lambdas are going to be real numbers. So they don't have to be, they could be complex generally, but if it's symmetric, they're real. And the bi's um, are mutually orthogonal. Now that's a big deal. We have n of them, and they're mutually orthogonal. So they form a basis. The bi's form an orthogonal basis of Rn, as it turns out. Generally, you don't have to have n distinct uh, uh, or n orthogonal or even n linearly independent eigenvectors. Um, but if it's symmetric, you will have them. And you'll have, be able to form a basis of Rn. And this is um, incredibly important and a really nice property of symmetric matrices. Um, the best way that this manif manifests is what's called the spectral decomposition of a matrix. So when you, um, when you see this word spectral, this word spectral refers to uh, eigen, let's say eigenpairs, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, um, eigen information. Of a matrix. So that's what this word. Um, you'll you hear the 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 uh, eigenvectors maybe or eigenvalues referred to as the spectra sometimes. <clears throat> and the spectral decomposition is that if A is symmetric, um, let Q be the matrix of eigen vectors and uh, assume their unit vectors. So we can choose them to be and scale them in any way we want. They're still eigenvectors, so we can choose them to be unit vectors. That doesn't change anything. We know they're mutually orthogonal, or at least if you believe my fact, they're orthogonal. So Q is an orthogonal matrix. And let D be a diagonal matrix of the corresponding eigenvalues. So uh, the mean is that on the main diagonal of D, it has the eigenvalues, and off the diagonal, we have zeros. So these two matrices, this is, you know, an n, they're both n by n. This is an n by n matrix. This thing is also n by n, right? Our fact here, or called the spectral decomposition, is that I can write A as Q, D, Q transpose. So what does this mean? If I have a symmetric matrix, and when we're going to talk about <coughs> covariance matrices, which are symmetric, um, we'll talk about symmetric matrices and where they appear. Turns out any symmetric matrix can be decomposed in terms of purely eigenvectors q and its eigenvalues d. Everything about that matrix is encoded in the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. Uh, it tells everything. And uh, let's leave it for there for now. Of course, this has to be, um, you have to have A as a symmetric matrix. We can generalize this, and we get what's not called the spectral decomposition, but what's called the singular value decomposition. And this is basically a generalization of the spectral decomposition, 
But here, A can be any arbitrary M by N matrix. Any matrix. It doesn't have to be have any special properties. It doesn't even have to be a real matrix. It could be complex. Any matrix. Um, then we can write A as a decomposition of three different matrices. A matrix called U, a matrix called D, and a matrix called V. And the decomposition is A is UDV transpose. So A is an M by N matrix. U is going to be an N by N matrix. D is going to be M by N. And V is going to be N by N. And of course, finally, V transpose. So this looks kind of similar, but instead of having just one matrix Q, we now have a U matrix and a V matrix. So <clears throat> let's talk about these parts. U is orthogonal. And, uh, and its columns are called um, the left, because it's on the left, singular vectors, and are a basis of the uh, column space of A. V is also orthogonal, um, and the columns of V, or the rows of V transpose, uh, columns are basis of row space of A, and called, these columns are called the right singular vectors. Um, because they're on the right, V is on the right of this of this equation, and D is uh, quote diagonal, basically a diagonal matrix. D has this structure; it has um, elements D one up to D R here. Um, where R is the rank of A, right? A is an arbitrary matrix, so it might not be full rank. Everywhere else is zero, and then off diagonal, off of this corner is zero. And these elements, these D sub I, are called the singular values, hence the name of the decomposition. So the word singular comes from the fact that this is an arbitrary, it could be a non-invertible, a singular matrix. Um, and so for the spectral decomposition, we had A is QDQ transpose, where Q is the eigenvectors, D is the eigenvalues. And um, because it's symmetric, Q are uh, a basis of either the row or column space, it's the same, same space um, in that case. In the case of an arbitrary matrix, you can generalize it. And you get this decomposition UDV transpose, where now U and V are still orthogonal, but the U's are the left singular vectors are a basis of the column space, and they're kind of like certain, they kind of behave like eigenvectors, not quite. V kind of behaves like eigenvectors, they're called right singular vectors, and they're basis of the row space. And D has these, is kind of diagonal. And it has elements that are called singular values to eigenvalues, but they play similar-ish role. It turns out a fact is that if we want to get u, d, and v, right, we want to get these things, you actually can get them from a spectral decomposition. Um, so the columns of u are the eigenvectors of A, A transpose. That's a symmetric matrix. A transpose is a symmetric matrix and um, called the left grand matrix. And so you can do a spectral decomposition, you can get the eigenvectors, that makes U. 
the columns of B are the eigenvectors of what's called the right gram matrix, A transpose A. And uh, the D sub I are the square root of the lambda sub I, where these lambda sub I are the E values of A transpose A or A, A transpose. Why do I say or? Turns out the eigenvectors of A, A transpose and A transpose A are the same. So it's intimately related with the, uh, with the spectral decomposition here. Um, and it's kind of a more general version of it. Probably the most, this single value decomposition, if you're going to learn one thing, learn this. Probably, the, maybe, arguably, the most useful fact in all of mathematics, I would say. Central limit theorems up there. I would say SVD. Um, so this is typically called the SVD, singular value decomposition. Arguably the most important thing in all of math. Um, I, I'd argue with math people about that. Uh, yeah, but it generalizes things. So I'm going to stop there. We're coming up an hour. So some of this review has been really simple. And then we got to some singular value decomposition, which maybe you haven't seen before. Um, it's worth doing some review of the linear. Um, you know, I'm going to try and review as we go along and try and teach some of the stuff as we go along. But the more review um, you can kind of do it in your own time, um, the better you'll be. Uh, I'll post, we'll have some problems on this, some homework problems on this um, to give you all some practice. Um, but I'm going to stop there. There will be a lab video also where we're going to go over some of the software um, and uh, programming concepts for this course.